everyone and welcome so I just get my details up here hi everyone and welcome to the allied air force webinar series for january um i'd be obliged if you would keep your cameras and your sound off until the presentation is over um, it just means that the the background noise is kept to a minimum that everyone can hear the presentation and that there's also no screens freezing or any delays as well So this is a brand new event for me and one that I'm really, really excited to be organising. Um, I will start by introducing myself. So my name is Claire Wilson and I'm a professional genealogist for Treehouse Genealogy based in Central Scotland. I also run the Allied Air Force Research website where I work as a researcher and aviation historian. I was born into the RAF family and my own interest in this topic stemmed from the research that I carried out into many of my own Air Force relatives and I'm sure like a lot of you my passion pretty much grew from there. During this year we will have an amazing range of speakers for you and these include uh, museum creators, authors, project managers and historians. You can find out more about these talks via the website and I will post a link into the chat box where you can check that out later on. If you take a moment to subscribe, you will also be sent details of the forthcoming events direct to your inbox. And I'm always happy to collaborate. So if you have a story to share with our audience, please get in touch. Um, I will post details of my contact page into the chat box. And also, if you're struggling with your own research, feel free to reach out via the website. Um, we also have a private Facebook group called Allied Air Force Research. It's an amazing place to chat about what you're researching, regardless of the time period or trade. It's a place to get advice, and it's also an amazing way to meet like-minded people. I will place a link to that group as well into the chat box. If you follow me already, then you will know that I do have an amazing relationship with pen and sword books. I'm currently speaking with some of their authors and hope um, to arrange some short interviews that can be included in forthcoming events. So watch this space and I will keep you updated on that one. I would also like to point out that they do stock an outstanding range of aviation books and I will post a link in the chat box where you can check these out for yourself. Our speaker this evening is Richie Conaghan of the Girvan and District Great War Projects and he's going to provide a presentation on remembering the fallen of South Carrick. For the last 10 years, Richie, along with his wife Lorna, who's also present tonight, um, have researched over 600 local men from, sorry, somebody else joining, <laughs> um, have researched 600 men from Girvan and South Carrick area who served during both wars. During his talk, Richie will share details of how they started the project, how it expanded, the areas that they've researched, other projects that they've worked on, and also give us some details of what they plan for the future. It will also detail some interesting individual stories that have been uncovered and will share with us Girvan's involvement with Turnberry Airfield during both wars. If you have any questions for Richie or Lorna, you can place them into the chat box or if you wait till the end of the presentation, um, you can ask directly. So yep. I'd like to welcome Richie and Lorna. Hi, how are you? Good evening. How is everyone? Good to see some familiar faces. Oh some familiar names up there. Um, as I say, we'll give a, 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 small, I'm saying a small presentation. We'll give a presentation on, as, as uh, Claire said, how we started and how we've progressed over the last 10 years. Um, this is new to me, so if it does go wrong, it will be a user error, definitely. Uh, it'll not be the computer. So, um, good to go at that, Claire, do you think? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay, then. If there's anything I spot, I'll, I'll keep you right. <laughs> okay, thanks. There we go. Right, so I'd just like to welcome everyone tonight and thank Claire for inviting us to um, to chat tonight, which is uh, a bit of a privilege for us because, as I say, 
it's not something that we've done before. Um, but I'll just run through my slides, if that's okay with everyone. Remember in the fall in the South Carrick, right? So you'll see there seven war memorials. I'll get onto that soon, but that's just a kind of indication of what we use as our template for the villages that we've researched. Right, a story so far, right? I'll explain why we started, how we expanded, where we have researched, turned airfield to both wars, other projects that we've been involved with and or that we are involved with, and where next. Right, why we started. Well, we've been doing the family tree for quite a while, right? So it was, as it says up there, pardon the pun, a whole new branch for us trying to do war research. We were that kind of generation that just remember the old men that were for the Great War and now we're at the stage where it's the old men we see up the street are the guys for the Second World War, if we're lucky. So it was in the run-up to the 100th anniversary back in 20, early 2014, to the run-up to the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War, that my mum asked, any chance you could look up a couple of people on the local war memorial? It's Common Air, which is a small village about 13 miles south for us. They were doing an exhibition later on that year. So there's 43 names on the war memorial at Common Air. Right? There's an early postcard of what it looked like kind of back in the day. And there's the names that we had. So the 43 names on the war memorial, and you're like, oh, right, okay, it's not just a couple of names. So since we were there, we thought, well, the church is open. We'll go up and have a look in the church. And as you go in the church door, they're facing you as a roll of honour. But it had 49 names. So obviously you can see a discrepancy straight away that uh, the numbers don't tie up. So while we were at the churchyard, we decided, well, we might as well have a wee look around. Right? So we started seeing quite a bit of discrepancies between the numbers and the names and what was on the Roll of Honour, what was on the War Memorial. So we decided at that point not to use the War Memorial as a guide, right? But I thought it best to include the fallen at all the village, right, with the fallen criteria. If they were on the War Memorial, if they were on the Church Roll of Honour, if they were born in the village, resided in the village and enlisted in the village, that would then give us a comprehensive list of the men that died in the, or women that died in the First World War. And that would give us a definitive list of that village's story of the First World War. But while we were researching Common Ale, of course, it's all kind of new to us. So you, you reach out to the local Facebook page, as you do. And there was a gentleman got back in touch with us. Um, about this certain gentleman here. Yeah. Well, you've got up so you have them up cold bills, but there's a cold line. Okay. I don't know if that's everyone can just stay muted, I would appreciate it. Right, Richie, sorry, carry on. All right, thanks, guys. Um, so we reached out to the local Facebook pages and this gentleman got in touch and said, I've got something that might be of interest to you. Now, as you can see there, there's a picture of Sergeant William Fox Ritchie. Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, and beside that was a poem that he wrote. So there's there's kind of a story behind it. Um, he had been sent back from the First World War in, in April of 19, or the end of March, beginning of April 1914, suffering from severe frostbite. Um, him and five others had been trapped for 19 hours waist high in the freezing mud of the Somme, and he was the only one that was pulled out while he was conscious. So he sent back to England, and then he sent back up to his home here in Commonwealth, or there in Commonwealth, to recuperate. So the background to that is his dad is a gamekeeper on a big private estate, and there's a big fancy house there called Bird Rocket. Now, they have a guest book, and while William was back, he decided to write this poem that you can see on the right hand side of your screen there while he was back suffering from frostbite. So he, he talks about his fears 
of it going back. He talks about the conditions that they live in. But the last few lines is, so I'm willing and ready to go there and if needs be, to stop there for good. So we've got the newspaper clippings which back up the story and we've got a copy of his information from the Daruvni's Roll of Honour. So William, he was a brave and resolute soldier that comes from his Daruvni's Roll of Honour. Um, he was recommended to receive the, the Croix de Guerre, but he never ever received it as his commanding officer was killed um, before it could be sanctioned. So the story behind that book, um, the family that owned the big house also owned a place called Marchmont near Buns on the East Coast. And the book at some point has travelled through there and it ended up in a junk shop. So they've obviously had a big clear out of the big house. And the man that got in touch with us, his daughter liked it because there was pretty pictures of flowers in it. So him being an English teacher, he's been teaching that poem to the kids at his school for the last 10, 15 years. Um, the book, along with all of our research, is now at the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders Museum. He's donated the book that has the poem in it. So they've got that as part of William Fox Ritchie's poem. So, that was just one guy, the men that we researched for the village. So that kind of gave us the bug for finding as much as we could on anybody that we were researching. So over the next four years, as you can see there, our original 43 men had become 60. So we decided to make up a book of remembrance, which you can see getting presented there, which now sits in the, the church hall and it's there permanently for anybody that's coming to the village. Um, that's wanting to look up any information on whether it be family members or just general a general interest in the World War One story of the village. And on Sunday, the eleventh of November, twenty eighteen, I had the, the pleasure of reading William Fox Ritchie's poem to the church service, and for the first time ever, all sixty names were read out loud at the war memorial on Remembrance Day, uh, and I can remember it vividly because it was chucking it down with rain, and they were playing um, Highland Cathedral in the background. So it was quite a moment. Right. So that that was common ale, and that was that was over the space of four years. But when once we had researched, they initially researched common ale, in 2014 we were going to, it was a church, a Christmas fete at the, at the school, and at the entrance to the school, as you can see from the pictures there, there's the Girvan High School Rule of Honour. Now, I kind of nudged Lorna and said to her, jokingly, or half-jokingly, there's your next project. And she went, aye, that'll be right. Uh, that was actually rescued from a skip. Um, the school is now part of the college, and when it was being renovated, they've obviously just cleared everything out, and it was flung in a skip and luckily enough um, the school the school Danny spotted it and rescued it so now it sits by the place as you go in the doors at the high school so there's 102 names on that right so I was thinking right okay 102 that's quite a lot then we went to the war memorial and it's got 156 excuse me 156 names it should only be 155, but there's an Arthur McLeod on it who was discharged in 1916 after the Dardanelles. And he's we've got letters there writing back for replacement medals in 1935 from New South Wales and Australia. So for obvious reasons, he shouldn't be on the War Memorial. However, this is a picture of Garden War Memorial taken last summer with the wildflowers that we worked in conjunction with the council to plant around the War Memorial as it was lead up to the 100th anniversary of the unveiling of the War Memorial. So we also took in all the other memorials in the town. Uh, these are from these are from a few churches that no longer exist. The one on the left is from the Trinity Church, and the one on the right is from St John's Church. Um, the one on the right was also rescued from a skip when the, when the church was getting demolished. Somebody went past and went, that shouldn't be in there. So we're quite grateful that that was managed to be rescued. So yeah, we're wondering about him. Okay, so we've got all these names in Girvan. Can we just do Girvan and Commonel? No, 
we decided that we would look at all, all the church memorials, the Masonic Lodge, the churchyard and cemeteries, uh, and the, the two villages. We decided to do, they were going to do all the local ones to Girvan, which are Ballantrae, Bar, Bar Hill, Commonel, Daly, obviously Girvan, and Kirkoswold and Maidens. The Kirkoswold and Maidens covers Turnbury Airfield, which I'll put on later on. So there's our seven war memorials. I'll read from the top left there's Ballantrae, then there's Bar, Bar Hill, and on the bottom left is Commonel. And there's Daly, Girvan, and Kirk Oswald and Maidens. But uh, it's in Maidens. So, Dune Cemetery, right? Now, you can see the war memorial there on the left hand side of your screen, and it's just a pop skip and a jump across to the cemetery. Uh, it's not that far away. But Dune recognised from an early, early on in my research at Girvan. That there was quite a lot of um, First World War flying related graves, right? So we've got five from the Flat Royal Flying Corps, five from the Royal Air Force, two for the Australians, and two American ones. Plus the name at the bottom, which some of you may or may not recognise, Lieutenant General Sir David Henderson, and I'll touch on him just shortly, right? So. Father, the father and son, right? You've got Lieutenant General Sir David Henderson and then Captain Ian Henry Davidson, eh, David Henderson military cross. So they're father and son and they're both buried at Girvan. But Sir David Henderson, for those of you that don't know, he was one of the founding fathers of the Royal Flying Corps. And if I can work out, I'll, I'll post a link that I've got to Sir David for those of you who want to find out some more information on him. Um, basically, in 1912, he came up, him and two other guys came up with the idea of the Royal Flying Corps, uh, and it was passed by Parliament in 1912. In 1904, by 1914, he was a commander in the field of the Royal Flying Corps in France, but he'd spotted a problem. They were getting a lot of friendly fire and shooting down the British planes. Now, at that point, on the underside of the wings, the, the Royal Flying Corps had the Union Jack painted on the underside of their wings, right? The German aircraft had the one in the middle, right? It's almost like a black Maltese cross. At night, sometimes that was quite hard to distinguish from, so they had to come up with something. So he'd obviously looked at the French Air Force Roundel, and then in, in October 1914, he wrote this letter to the French saying, look, we need to change what we've got on our planes. And I think this letter is in the National Archives, and I think that may possibly be the first time that the RAF roundel was drawn. So as you can see, it's very similar to the French one. It's just the colours have been changed round about the suit. So that's quite a massive thing to have him buried here. And as I say, he's buried alongside his son. Uh, Ian was killed uh, in June 1918, and on the, the right hand side, there you can see his funeral procession. Proceeding, proceeding, heading through the streets of Girvan, uh, heading towards the Dune Cemetery. They're buried together. Uh, so David Henderson died in 1921. After the death of his son, uh, it, it happened quite hard, as you can imagine. Uh, it was his only child, and he then went and worked in Geneva and he was basically in charge of the Red Cross. But uh, he never ever recovered for the death of his son. And as he died in August 1921, uh, and his ashes were brought back and buried next to his son in Girvan. Um, his son David, it does, it does say that he died as a result of an accident. Um, I've got some information that came to us from a lady I'll touch on just shortly. Um, and it's almost kind of, it really was an accident. There was him and his co pilot decided to change seats at over a thousand feet, and it kind of went wrong. So, uh, yeah. And on the 100th anniversary of the RAF, we had a fly past of his grave to commemorate him and all that he'd done for what is now the RAF. 
Turnberry Airfield in the Second World War, and it, for some strange reason, the guys that died during the First World War are buried in Girvan. All the guys from Turnberry Airfield that died during the Second World War are buried at Denour. I have no rhyme or reason as to why that is the case. Um, the Commonwealth War Graves don't even know why that's the case. But there we have it. So there you can see a lovely picture of Denour Cemetery, where it's Cross the Sacrifice and the famous Hills of Craig in the background. So, Turnberry Airfield. This wee lady here. From quite early on, we realised that there was a lot of the RAF guys and the Royal Flying Corps. So we're looking at, well, should we research this? This is where we found Margaret Morell. She had been researching Turnberry Airfield War Memorial for, at that point, over 25 years. Um, we thought, right, we're not stepping on somebody's toes, so we thought we'll just leave that to Margaret. Now, she was going up and down to the National Archives at a point where the internet was, I would say it was in its infancy, but there wasn't as much online. She had discovered that it was only the names of the pilots that had went on the memorial and know the crew members. So that was her mission, was to find these other names and have them added to the war memorial. And that's what she said on Sunday the 8th of November 2020, after an additional 89 names were added. Um, it is basically through her hard work, dedication and research that that happened. Uh, I know how proud she was because I spoke because I was there and I spoke there after it. Uh, and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that, having that as a, a monumental thing. There you can see part of the RAF plinth as it was in July 17. Uh, and that's how it looked in November 2020. And that's just the Royal Air Force ones. There's Canadians and Australians added on as well. Um, so having having all the extra names makes life easier for those coming to pay their respects to their family whose, whose names are now added on to it. As I say, all the casualties from the Second World War at Tumbrey are buried at Denour Cemetery. And every single one of them was a result of an accident. No friendly fire, nothing, not a thing. Now, We've got 10 Royal Air Force, one unknown, 10 Royal Canadian, 10 Australian, and three Royal New Zealand Air Force buried there. Uh, but we've got a very, very, or very unique grave at the Noor, and that is the only married couple buried together in a Commonwealth war grave, Douglas and Margaret Fairweather. Uh, it's actually quite a sad story with them because they died four months apart, and slap bang in the middle of that, Margaret gave birth to her daughter. Um, so her, her wee girl was orphaned when she was only a couple of months old. Margaret Fairweather is one of those very, very special people. She was one of the first eight at the Air Transport Auxiliary, and she was reportedly the first woman to fly a Spitfire. Now, I don't need to kind of preach to MD, it does Air Force research. That's massive. That's a huge, huge thing. Um, and I feel very privileged as an eyes-on, hands-on volunteer for the Commonwealth War, War Graves. I feel very, very privileged to look after their grave, as I do with all the graves. But when you've got the granddaughter and great-great-granddaughters coming to visit the grave, it just makes it that wee bit more special. As I say, if anybody's looking to find out any more information on Turnberry Airfield during both wars, it is a fascinating read uh, by Margaret. And less than a year after the names were added onto the, the war memorial at Turnberry, Margaret sadly passed away. And it's just a life dedicated to remembering those at Turnberry Airfield and on the war memorial. And I can only thank her for the help that she gave us with the guys from Turnberry that are buried at Girvan that she gave us information from. So, other projects. Now, I'm not going to bore you with hunters and hunters and stuff, but on the left there is a picture of, a, as you can see, a private Ernest James Grendel. And on the right-hand side there are two white crosses belonging to French sailors that are buried in the grave. 
touch on Ernest Grendel first. Uh, the page on the, the left hand side that you can see is, is one page of seven that were handed in to us. We don't know who wrote them. We don't know where it came from. Well, you know where it came from to us, but he can the guy can of remember where he got it from. And it's basically a, a, an old type diary of the long march from Poland to Germany from January to May in 1945. So have a wee read through it, and there's two names mentioned. One's a regimental sergeant, Major Wheeler, and the other one is an Ernest Grendel. So it says in there that he was buried in a small churchyard near Maras in Germany. So being ever the amateur detective, I was onto the Commonwealth War Graves, and they've got Ernest Grendel down on the Dunkirk Memorial, which suggests they don't know where he's buried. So me being really clever sends us to the Commonwealth War Graves thinking, woohoo, we've found something. They send me a wee email back saying, although it indicates it's happened, we need more information. However, I can tell you that one casualty was recovered after the war from that churchyard and he's now buried in Berlin 1939-45 War Cemetery in an un unknown grave. And that is the actual grave and that came from Ian Anderson of the Commonwealth War Graves. So how do you find out more information? Well, my good old friend Google comes in. I was on the Google, searches Ernest Grendel, finds that he's in Stalag 20B. Right? So, searches Stalag 20B, and lo and behold, there's a Facebook page that comes up for Stalag 20B. So I get in touch with them, and they send me this handwritten diary that has very, very similar information. So I ask, where does this diary come from? And it belongs to the man on the right-hand side, Regimental Sergeant Major James Fulton. He was Stalag 20B's man of confidence in the camp. So basically, your your Alec Guinness on the River Bridge or the River Kwai, he kept a diary from the day they were captured in Dunkirk until the day they were liberated in 1945. So I'm thinking, well, that any information that I need is going to be in that diary. Where is this diary? It's at Fort George comes to reply. I went, right, okay, so I could get a trip up to Inverness coming. His, his grandson's a surgeon in Chicago. He's got a digital copy. I wonder if he would send it to you. So, over the space of three or four months, emails going back and forth. Eventually, this diary appears. So, I know I've got a window. Ernest Grendel dies in Mar the middle of March 1945. So, I searched from January to May within the diary to see how many people died and where this man, James Fulton, has written down where they were buried. I then cross-referenced every single one of them to the Commonwealth, to where the diary said he was buried, to where the Commonwealth War Grave said he was buried. So if they'd been exhumed from the location in the diary and buried elsewhere, I was getting this information from the Commonwealth War Graves. So I managed to tick 11 of them off, and I've got one left, and it's Ernest James Grendel. So that information was submitted about two years ago to the Commonwealth War Graves. Just before Christmas, they got in touch and they were making plans to come up and look at the information within the diary. So we're kind of hoping at some point in the future that that wee grave will turn to Private Ernest James Grendel, 4th Battalion of the Cheshire Regiment. So that would be quite nice. And I've got my two wee French boys that are buried here. Was originally three... Um, their ship was torpedoed off Corswell Lighthouse, which is just kind of between Ireland and Sunrar, just down the coast from us. And there was three bodies washed up on the coast. Now, they were all buried at the Dune Cemetery. Uh, the French consulate bought the graves uh, and they were buried there. Adolphe Harry and Samuel Brazil. And in the middle of them was buried King Joseph Huey. If you look at that picture on the left hand side, you'll see the two white crosses and you'll see the stump of the cross that would have been there originally. Now, looking through the burial records at the crematorium up in air, we've got the burial records for the cemetery, we could see that his body was exhumed and removed to France in March, April wait, 1923. So, French consulate still own that middle grave still own all three graves. So it would be quite nice 
as there's 33 other guys still lying out in that water through the gate who have no final resting place. It'd be quite nice to get some form of memorial put up. Um, but we'll see how we'll see how that goes. But the newspaper reports at the time, um, the Carrick Herald, November the 9th, 1917. That is actually where, roughly where his body washed up. That's the, the shore just down from us where we stay. The newspaper reports from St Malo, he, was, he had two sealed letters addressed to his wife, a number of French banknotes and coins, a leather wallet with cards and other papers, one or two keys and two pocket knives. On his fingers were two gold rings, one plain and inscribed J. Huey M. Chatelet, 6th of May 1905, the other a heavier ring. He also wore a silver watch, the hands of which had stopped at a quarter to twelve, the gold albert attached was a sovereign case containing a lack of dark, a lock of dark hair. Quarter to twelve was the time that the SS Longby was torpedoed. Uh, so we're assuming that his watch would have popped uh, at the time at the water. The other two bodies that washed ashore, they were both at that time classed as unknown, um, but they later found out inf information that led to them being named. And about a month and a half later, uh, a body was washed up at Ballantrae, which is probably about 15 miles south of us. And it says in the entry on Scotland's people, possibly French sailor. Uh, they obviously recognised it wasn't a British sailor. So we're wondering if he were, he could well be from the long way. However, we cannot find any records of where he's buried or, and he obviously doesn't have a headstone. So. That's another one for the back burner, but there's probably about a million and six things on the back burner. We are next. Well, as I said, we just continue to do what we do. Top left there, that was when we done the candles at the graves on Christmas Eve in 2018. Uh, we had 153 graves that had a posy, a candle. Uh, we had a photograph, we put the photograph down. Uh, for Christmas Eve, because at the end of the day, there'd be a lot of these graves were never visited by family. Uh, so it was always nice to know that somebody's remembering them. Top middle there, that was uh, November 2018. That was the kids' primary school. We gave them all a name and a regimental number from the Second World War, and we said to them, go and use your computers and your tablets and your phones and try and find out what you can on these men. Uh, and make a book up on them uh, and uh, some of them were really really successful and what they did was they painted a stone with the name of every single man from the second world war Lauren and I painted a stone of every man from the first world war and they were all down for Remembrance Sunday on the 100th anniversary bottom left there footprints, I don't know if any uh, seen these when they were on the go um, we'd done a couple of bootprint days we'd done one at the train station in Girvan, where the people came and put the prints down in memory of their, their family members or someone they were remembering. Because at the end of the day, the train station would have been the last time a lot of them say put on Girvan soil, for want of a better phrase. And in the middle there is our good friend Jim McCracken from the King's Own Scottish Borderers. Now that's in the McKechnie Institute in Girvan, which at that time was a library, but it was also sort of used as a recruiting station. So we had lines of footprints up to the desk and then from the desk down the stairs outside and then they basically marched up to the train station. Uh, we did plan to have a V75 day thing, but a certain COVID kind of put paid for that. But that's one of the original V day parties in Girvan at Birtree Hall. Uh, so that was the kind of thing we were trying to recreate. And as I say, in October last year, we had a rededication of the War Memorial to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the unveiling, which you can see in the picture of kind of birds today, or as it is now and as it was then. Uh, and then at the bottom, as I said, I'm an eyes on hands on volunteer for the Commonwealth War Graves. So we record and, and look after the graves. I've got 120 different graves over nine different cemeteries that I look after. So it's good to be involved with that. So. That is 
time at it. If anybody's got any questions, feel free to, to ping them on or ask me the new. My email address is there. Um, you can find us on Facebook or get us on Twitter if you want to get in touch. Uh, I think Claire will maybe possibly put the links up. And if I can just work out how to get back to the video, we'll be hunky dory. There we go, I think. That's fab. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions? I've put details um, for the links for Facebook and Twitter into the chat box for anyone that's interested. So if you want, you can unmute yourself, turn your camera off and ask a question, or if you'd rather put it in the chat box, then feel free to do that as well. I shall put, what I'll do is I'll put the link to Sir David Henderson. Yeah. If anybody's wanting to look that information up, you can see there it says the Forgotten Father of the RAF. I just think it's amazing how, you know, you start off with, what was his name, William Ritchie? Uh -huh. And you've got this amazing story that this, you know, and this poem that you've got. Yeah. You can see how this project. <coughs> you know. Well, if some of them turn their cameras on, I might even recite it for them. <laughs> before you, before <coughs> before you do that, Richie, thanks ever so much. It's been really interesting, Richie. Thank you very much. Hey, brother, hi. Thank that. you. Thank you. I've got I've got to go now. I've got a curry on the go. <laughs> <laughs> nice seeing you, Harry. Enjoy. Okay, see you, see you soon, Claire. See you. Cheers, Harry. Mm -hmm. oh. So you're going to re recite this poem up? There's more yes. going. I think you're yeah, going there's Mr. Duncan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shall I speak? Just to say, Richie, great. I mean, fantastic. What a great story you've, you've got there and learnt things there that I didn't know you were up to, but really, really great. Um, since we spoke, uh, I have found on French websites uh, someone who's very enthusiastic about the long we and has been researching it for um, several years, at least from 2010. And so I reached out to him and we'll see if we can find um, more about uh, the French side of, of that particular story and help yeah. you out on that. That would be great. Thanks, John. That would be really good. I think these events are amazing because it does get your story out there and then potentially you have people approaching you who have got more information that you perhaps didn't you know, know that they had. That is the joy of putting projects out there. And, that, and, that, and that's the thing. It's like, I see Richard Jackson, when he got in touch with the poem, you're like, oh my God, this has been written by one who... We're very protective of our boys. Um, it's like, wow, this is one of our boys' story. Uh, and it's just great to get that information. Unfortunately, you can't get that kind of information on every single person. Uh, there's a few that we're really struggling to find, but out of the 600 nodes, I think there's probably about eight that we can't find stuff on. Right. Five. That's not five. That's the lovely true. Debbie McGee says it's only five. So, <laughs> and she does speak. It's not a cardboard cut. <laughs> That's not bad going though. I mean, you find sometimes with war memorials, you've got you know common names, and then you start to research, especially World War One, you know, and you're looking for service records, and and there's so many people with the same name that it becomes a bit of a minefield. So oh. it, that's pretty good going. Well, we've got one. It was a, a Robert Fraser, which is probably quite a common name, but his death penny was found in the garden in a house in Commonwealth when they were building an extension back in the 1980s. So we then found out that because the family never had a body or a grave to go to, they buried the death penny in the garden and that's where they wanted to go and pay their respects to them. This, this is where they went. And it was like, oh, my, that makes sense. Yeah. So... And you just you just can't believe as well that you know there's people in this day and age that throw, you know, a roll of honour out into a skip. Oh, it's frightening. It's you frightening. I mean, it's obviously been some young guys have been told by their boss, go and clear that dirt, fling everything in the skip and then we'll just demolish it. And it just so happened that somebody was passing and noticed it. So thankfully it's been saved. You know, but... I can see a blog article coming on about that, you know, just to put that out there because to me, if you're clearing out a building, the right thing to do would be to hand it over to a local archive or, you know, a library even that, that could perhaps just put it up on their, their wall. Well, that's it. I mean, and it's God forbid anybody 
doing their family research, they're trying to find stuff in the poor house in Dundee because they were all in a basement and they needed space, so it was off, they were off looking a skit and bend and all these poor relief records and you think, oh my God, what information. They did that with the Edinburgh ones as well, actually. Just a nightmare, just a nightmare. Yeah, which it's horrifying, it really is. Has anyone else got any questions for Richie and Lorna? Is it all very quiet? I know. Jackie, were you going to ask something? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, thank you very much. It's very inspiring. I have a great uncle who died in the Second World War at age 20. Uh-huh. We just discovered. Um, and, I mean, I knew about him, but I didn't, you know, the family, my family never spoke to each other. So, you know, I, t I think I'm now the person that knows the most. But what I've discovered is that when the Lancaster went down, Everybody was killed apart from one person who became a prisoner of war. And any, I've looked on various Air Force websites and nobody mentions this Lancaster. So what I want to do is to do something similar to you, try and find something out about the individuals who are in it and possibly try and get in contact with the family of the person who survived. Uh -huh. You know, I've just, I haven't done any military research at all. So I'm just kind of starting out on, you know. That sounds like your bag, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, first of all, I hope that the webinar series, we're, we're running it for the whole year, and, uh, you know, there are very, very topics and speakers, so I hope that you will find it of interest. Yeah, um, I hope yeah. in my diary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, feel free to, to reach out. If, there's, if I can point you in the right direction, um, feel free to do that. I've also got a handout. So if you drop me a message via the website, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the handout and hopefully okay. that'll give you some pointers yeah, that's great. to get you started as well. And the one thing I would always say to people is if you're researching a crew on an aircraft, research everyone on that crew because you just don't know. You might go into somebody else's paperwork and find something out about your relative. So, exactly. I mean, what I've discovered just from Find My Path is that... Um, the oh I forgot give me a moment I was just distracted by a spider walking across my floor oh. <laughs> you need to go and get it uh, you know no no it's climbing up the wall so if I dash oh, off it's all right. there's one behind you as well uh, it's okay I can see behind me because I've got the camera on I can nice, see you nice try <laughs> uh, yeah so I just think it would be nice to find out more about them the only thing it says on the Find My Past is that they came from a conversion unit. So he'd only been in the service about nine months when he was killed. Um, and he'd come from some conversion unit, which I believe is he was perhaps flying one type of plane and yeah. came to another one. But the whole crew was only put together three weeks before they went down. So I don't know how much information. I'm going to try and fill in the forms and get my mum to apply for the his records you know to see if I can find anything out about him yeah as I say I've got a handout that I can send on to you that hopefully will point you in the right direction that's what I'll be doing when I come off here then because <laughs> the information's scattered in lots of different places so um yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian's Brian's just put into the chat box and um, we have an organization down here in Leicestershire that, un that recover war memorials from closed down buildings um mm -hmm. and it's www at risk warmemorials.co.uk Brian I think I'm going to actually write a blog article on abandoned and discarded war memorials because I just think it, it, you know there's a topic in there isn't there yeah there is uh, I mean certainly that one these I mean you know some of the ones Richard mentioned you know they found in skips and that I mean there's an example if you go onto that website you'll see one um it, it's basically it's a metal war memorial and it was folded in half by scrap merchants or folded in half and it was taken to scrap merchants to be sold to you know for money uh the scrap merchants obviously realized what was going on and they tried to straighten it out with the forklift truck but they, they had it all um, on camera and reported it to the police and that so they had it all on cctv so the, you know the people that tried selling it got caught in that so but yeah i mean they've got about 30 or 40 in the in their collection at the moment from you know um factories that are closing schools churches chapels you name it what they try and do is 
wherever possible relocate the memorial in the local community mm -hmm. but if not they'll take it into their care and look after it themselves yeah i mean i, I know that that's something that's quite <clears throat> prevalent up here because the church of scotland have been selling a lot of churches but that is that where it's worth contacting whether it be the church of scotland church of england and say to them look if you're selling a church make the war memorial list before you sell it i don't know if that um, would be a lot, a lot of the war memorials in churches are listed as part of the church being a grade one, grade two listed structure. They're not listed separately, unlike uh -huh. you know your crosses or whatever in the in the middle of your village. So I don't know if you can get them listed separately. Um, I'm not sure about Scotland, um, but we've got an organisation called the Historic Churches. Can't remember the proper name, but they look after all all the closed churches and things like that that aren't used anymore. Uh -huh. Um, I'll, I'll try and find a link and send it on. But again, you know, the churches are, are closed. Sometimes they're converted into cafes or things mm -hmm. like that. But the, this historic church organisation, they still have overall control for the property in that. Uh -huh. And a lot of the memorials are, are still sat in there. I think I think the what you're saying, Richie, about the churches up here. I noticed there was one that was up for sale, but it said in it, I think you could buy the church and convert it to a house, but that there was a war memorial in the foyer, but you had to make a separate entrance so that that was still viewable for members right. of the public. So I think it maybe depends from church to church what what the process yeah. is. But yeah, I mean, there's so many churches now closing down or amalgamating that what do you do with them i mean i, I mean, know there's a local church to me that um has been converted into houses recently and i don't actually know what happened to that one memorial i'm fortunate enough to have photographs of it all but yeah i'd like to find out what, what did happen it'd be interesting to follow up on that actually i mean i, I do a lot with war memorials i volunteer and wherever i go i'm photographing them and recording you know the, the condition of them and that um and there's two two good websites you've got war memorials online mm -hmm. which is maintained by an organization called war memorials trust right. and then the other one is the imperial war museum the war memorials register yeah yeah but yeah, tr yeah. trouble with them is neither of them are complete and mm -hmm. i'm coming across loads of memorials all the time that don't appear on those two databases especially the smaller ones you know the plaques the tablets the stained glass windows whatever inside churches and chapels and that yeah. A lot of them have never been listed before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, all your village crosses and cenotaphs and whatever, you'll find them listed, but not not yeah. the smaller ones inside factories or churches and that. Mm. I know. And the Imperial War Museum list of war memorials is great. You know, uh, there's lots that you can find. If you're researching someone, a lot of the time you can search on there for whatever town it was and perhaps find pictures of the war memorial and find where they actually were. So it's really quite useful. Yeah, yeah the good thing about that site as well is you can search by the casualties name as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. We've had a couple of the ones for Girvan added onto the Imperial War Museum, like some of the church yeah. ones. Um, but we're quite fortunate in the respect that the ones that used to be in some of the churches are now in what, what's called the North Parish Church. So when you go there, you've got quite a, quite a variety of different ones, but although they're from different churches. But... The South Parish Church that we have is is due to close or due to amalgamate. So I may possibly make a request that the church roll of honour from the south gets moved up to the north so that when the building does eventually either go up in flames or get demolished, that um, that's not going up where it kind of thing. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I noticed Sarah's put a note in for Jackie to say most World War II records are still at the National Archives at Kew, including files on each crash. Um, these are currently available to around 1942, but increasing all the time. Um, if there was anything, Jackie, I'll send you the handout, but if there is anything that you identify that <coughs> perhaps needs checking at the National Archives, I work along with Sarah, so I can check with her, and if there's anything that needs photographs, then um, between you know myself and Sarah's team down, down in London, we can obviously get something sorted for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Is it due to the closure period? Um, yeah, well, they do, they do have a lot of the kind of operational record books and station record books and not everything's available to download. Some of it you need to go to the National Archives 
and that's where Sarah and her team come in handy because yeah. I'm in Scotland, she's she's in London, but we work very closely together. Um, if she needs anything in Scotland, I get it for her and vice versa. Um, but yeah, you know, the, certainly the service records are set to move to the National Archives over the next six years or so. Um, they're in the process of obviously starting to digitise things and check that there's nothing that shouldn't be hidden for um, privacy reasons, etc. But that's set to move there as well. So that'll be good whenever the service records are there as well for World War Two. Yeah, definitely. But Thank the you. Process at the moment's not brilliant, so. <laughs> Do you know the details of the Lancaster set, uh, Jackie dear? Do you know the aircraft serial number in that? Um, I, I, yeah, I know the, the, the ND number. The, the aircraft the number. Of, oh, sorry, hold on, I need to call it up. I wasn't planning on looking at it. <laughs> That's right, no, if you've got it, what you can do is also try the um, RAF Museum as well, because they have accident record cards. Yeah. Okay. There's, another, there's another website called, I think it's lancasters.net, and you can get the lost cards as well. But yeah, if yeah. you have a handout, Jackie, if you drop me a message, I'll send that to <clears> you, <throat> and you can just work your way through it. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you. All right. Has anyone else got any questions? I would, could I just jump in a wee second? You are talking about researching the other guys that are on the plane or, or the other members of the crew. Um, kind of, on a side note to that, Turnbury Airfield, I mean, some of us will be of an age where we can remember pro celebrity golf from Turnbury back in the day with Jimmy Tarbuck and Aye. God knows what else. Um, there was a certain person that used to come and play quite regular up there, and that was Brewster Scythe, because mm -hmm. his brother died just out there. There was three Beauforts on their way back to Turnbury, and one of them ditched in the sea, and the two other ones went back round. And uh, they crashed into each other, and one of the guys on board was Bruce Forsyth's brother. Just another piece of useless information, but lots of that stuff that manages to clag into your brain that you never forget. I don't. I mean, I find sometimes I just can't get away from it. I was actually, um, I run a one place study for my local town, and I was researching a guy the other day and pulling up his mouth. He was a photographer pulling up lots of information, and here, next thing I pulls up, he was actually in the Air Force during World War One, and I thought, I can't get away from this. <laughs> I've got all these airmen that just keep popping up all the time. And then I've recently found, I was doing my husband's um, family tree at Edinburgh and up pops two guys from from a, what the Seven Bomber Command in World War Two. So I thought, oh, that's why he likes going to all these events with me. It's obviously in the blood somewhere. <laughs> well, Bomber Command was handy then. Yeah, yeah, I know. So uh, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Um, I will put all, if anyone's watching on the, the catch up on YouTube, I will put all the links that we've posted today um, onto there as well. Um, let me just give you details of next month's speaker. Um, so next month event, event takes place on Wednesday the 22nd of February at 7pm. The speaker will be retired Wing Commander Chris Goss. Who now works as an aviation historian, author, consultant, and charity trustee. After 32, a 32 year career in the RAF and three years working for a civilian company as the head of operations, he's now a full time aviation author and military historian, a much recognised and sought after contributor to major aviation and historical journals in the UK, France, and Germany since 1983. He's written over 50 critically acclaimed books covering aspects of the air war over Northwest Europe between 1939 and 45. And during his presentation, he's going to share with us the challenges and enjoyment of becoming an aviation historian and author. Um, what I'll do is I'm just going to pop some details into the chat box. You can actually go in now and register for this webinar. Um, so I'll give everyone just a minute if you want to copy anything out of the chat um, or save the chat. If you go to the bottom of the chat box, open chat at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom there's three little dots that says more. Click on that and you should be able to save everything that's in the chat box. Um, and as I say, you can register at the moment um, for next month's event. And lots of uh, nice compliments to Richie for, for your talk. Thanks so much, folks. <laughs> um, it, didn't go, it didn't go too bad. 
The computer didn't crash and the dog didn't I know, attack. I know, no, all went well. She's uh, just lying, chasing things in her dreams. <laughs> um, and we've even got Ray watching from the Netherlands, hi Ray. <laughs> um, so thanks very much, Richie and Lorna, lovely yeah, seeing you. Well, Thank you so much for your time and I hope that, you know, you maybe get some more information through your presentation today and people contacting you. <laughs> and thanks to for everyone for attending. I look forward to seeing you all next month. Okay, thanks again, Claire. Bye.